what do you make of the of that problem? Is it a real problem? And, and does my dog have justified beliefs? But it's an interesting question. And uh, exit interviews from dogs have been sketchy. So we have to <laughs> do a certain amount of conjecture here, which is fine. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Setacase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy and theology. I used to always say nature and life, but I, this is a philosophy and theology podcast. Uh, today's a really special episode. I have with me Dr. Tim McGrew. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, we're going to be talking about internalism in epistemology. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. We're going we're gonna to totally define terms. You are going to be an expert in epistemology by the end of this podcast. I'm really, really excited. We're going to talk about internalism, externalism, some reasons against externalism. I'm super jazzed for it. I'm in an epistemology class right now, so it, it's all it's all in there. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. If you want to support this podcast, if you want to see this thing uh, continue, please consider becoming a Patreon patron. You can find a link in the description. Um, but let's not do uh, too much self-promotion right now. I'm, I'm excited for this conversation. So let's jump right in with Dr. Tim McGrew. We're going to be talking about his book uh, with his wife. Uh, Lydia McGrew. It's called uh, Internalism and Epistemology, the Architecture of Reason. So here we go. Dr. McGrew, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Good to be here, Parker. But before we jump in, um, uh, I like to ask just random philosophy questions. Do you consider yourself a, um, are you an epistemologist who's, con who's interested in other philosophy or are you a philosopher who's uh, primarily focused in epistemology? Does that yeah, either one of those. I'm not sure exactly where the line falls between those two. Mm. Let's say okay. I'm a philosopher with wide philosophical interests, but I tend to approach most of those by means of epistemological questions, epistemological tools, mm. and I try to bring those to bear and to deal with the subject matter in a rigorous way. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. I would expect that from you. That's really good. Uh, did you do your, uh, what did you do your dissertational work on? did it on foundationalism. Uh, so my first book was actually a rewrite of the dissertation, and that's the Foundations of Knowledge, uh, Littlefield Adams, 1995. And that was really the set of issues that got me interested in philosophy in the first place. I hmm. was interested in Christian apologetics, but I realized that there were questions about knowledge, evidence, and reason that were going to need to be answered in a very, very rigorous way. Mm. And so I decided philosophy was the path for that, went into the study of philosophy, worked on that and the philosophy of science for some years and have a strong interest in the history of philosophy of science as well. Again, uh, epistemological questions rise up very naturally in that yeah. field. So yeah, that's that's kind of the direction that I went, the path that I took getting into it. Yeah. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna be talking about internalism and externalism. Uh, before we define those terms, though, you've noted uh, you and Lydia noted in the book that uh, internalism is is not as popular, or at least at the time of the book, it, it wasn't as popular. Mm -hmm. It's kind of going against the grain. Um, did you have any like pressure to be an externalist? Like, why? why how come? How did you? Uh, how were you steadfast in being an internalist when oh, there's so much external pressure from the externalists? Yeah. So uh, I never felt that I was under pressure, but that's partly because I am a natural born contrarian. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the meme "Honey Badger Don't Care," but it's uh, <laughs> yeah. it, that's basically the McGrew family motto: is you know we're just going to do this the best that we can, we're going to try to speak the truth. And if other people are going to disagree, they are welcome to bring arguments. Mm. But arguments are the only things that are going to sway us on this. And the arguments for various forms of externalism, uh, you know, reliable method, reliable indicator, truth tracking, uh, kinds of things, subjunctive theories, uh, those never really seemed at all compelling. In fact, in many ways, such approaches seemed like they were changing the subject because mm. the people advocating them had decided that, oh, to put it in Philip Kitcher's phrase, uh, skepticism is a mugs game, right? It's all mm. rigged. Yeah. Uh, the, de the deck is stacked. The P is not under any of the shelves, whatever metaphor you want to use, but it, <laughs> yeah. it can't, it just can't be done. So let's go do something else. Mm -hmm. And my take on it was even if it were true that it couldn't be done, that's the question I wanted answered. Hmm. And I'm really not interested in the externalist approaches. They just don't really address any questions that drew me to philosophy in the first place. Yeah. Or they seem to me to be a massive redefinition of terms. 
And so being the intransigent Athanasian kind of fellow that I am, I just hmm. said, well, you know, if the world's against me, I'm against the world. Tough luck. Uh, I like my odds. So we're just going to stay here. <laughs> and awesome. so, yeah, that was that's kind of the direction that that all went. Um, okay. But I never felt like I was under pressure. Maybe that's partly because I didn't do philosophy coming from within the Christian community as a Christian coming and saying, okay, what are the most revered figures saying right now? Yeah. I think maybe people who approached it from within in certain places, certain contexts, felt a lot of pressure to acquiesce in something like Alvin Plantinga's reformed epistemology. That's that's or, exactly where I came from. Yeah. I was like, well, Plantinga solved all this. And then I would read stuff yeah. like you. I'm like, oh, there's still internalists out there. Holy cow. Yeah. And so I, I didn't come with that set of social pressures behind me. Hmm. So I had the luxury, if you want to put it that way, of being able to look at those controversies from a detached perspective and say, OK, but this is really a form of epistemic externalism and I have problems. Hmm. And so, of course, you know, we read Plantinga's Warrant Trilogy, but we do so without having a prior commitment to it. And it just did not seem to me to be convincing. Yeah, well, that's really helpful uh, and, and fascinating. So when we talk about internalism and externalism, uh, yeah, what do we mean? What, what do those terms mean? Yeah, the, the terms have a certain range of application. So you always have to check when you're reading someone and say, all right, is, is this person talking about knowledge or is this person talking about the factor which, when added to true belief, makes for knowledge if there is just one factor? Mm -hmm. So um, – a broad way of putting it, though, one that already gets some people hot under the collar because it involves a certain amount of terminological uh, fiat, is to say that you can be an externalist about knowledge mm. or an externalist about justification. I'm going to use justification for the moment in a, just the broad sense of the thing that you plug in with true belief to make for knowledge if there is only one thing. And yeah. I think that in a certain sense there is. Uh, but let's talk about internalism about justification, this would have it that the factors that make us justified in believing things when we are justified, if we are justified, are factors that lie wholly within our awareness. So if I am justified in believing some proposition, it is not in virtue of processes that are operating that are outside my ken, that I have no access to. Yeah. Rather, it's in some sense in virtue of things that I do have cognitive access to, whether I'm thinking about them explicitly or not, that I am not merely right in my beliefs, but justified in holding those beliefs. Okay. Um, externalisms tend to say, and, and this is where the term justification is sometimes considered to be a bit freighted, that the thing that you need besides true belief to make knowledge can be a thing that involves factors that lie wholly outside of your scope. They could be uh, benevolent aliens priming you with beliefs, but as long as that's reliable, perhaps that counts for making your true beliefs into knowledge. They are, in fact, reliably caused yeah. or something of that sort. Uh, and, and there's a whole set of variations on the theme. There are family resemblances be among the various uh, forms of externalism, but that's a, a really quick and dirty version. Yeah. Okay. So I, um, like I said, I, I came in, uh, just thinking planning that has to be right. And everyone taught me that he was right. Um, not everyone, but many did. And I asked a friend about, uh, the matrix and, you know, so Neo has been systematically deceived, but when he wakes up, I was thinking, you know, I don't know if, if this dude like would be justified in believing anything anymore because he's been systematically deceived. And my friend, the externalist said, well, you know, it just matters if he's in the good case or not. And I'm like, what? He doesn't have to be aware. How does he know if he's in the good case? He doesn't matter. It just is he. But like, how do I? So that kind of moved me right. more towards considering internalism. Um, but when it comes to like uh, awareness or or um, access uh, to you know reasons uh, for our beliefs, I think of like I don't know. I've never said his name out loud, but is it Bonjour? Uh, yeah, Lawrence? Lawrence okay, Bonjour. So, um, He's got this, uh, just raised this uh, initial problem, the problem of unsophisticated epistemic subjects. And so I put my dog as my little cartoon version of my dog, Theophilus, as our background. And, and you can't see, but he's thinking. And I think about, you know, my dog. I, I think my dog probably has beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe he has justified beliefs. But then, you know, if, if they are justified, he's this, you know, unsophisticated 
uh, epistemic subject, what justifies his beliefs? And then you kind of think, well, it seems like, I don't know, proper function or something, but I don't want to go in for that. So what, what do you make of the, of that problem? Is it a real problem? And, and does my dog have justified beliefs? But it's an interesting question. And, uh, exit interviews from dogs have been sketchy. So we have to <laughs> do a certain amount of conjecture here, which mm -hmm. is fine. Um, but since they don't verbalize what they're saying, we have to try to conjecture uh, to sort of take one of Thomas Nagel's metaphors. What is it like to be Theophilus? What is it like to be yeah. your dog? Right. And I would say, though, subject to correction, if there are better data out there, that, yeah, uh, many higher mammals do, in fact, have beliefs. They just don't verbalize and articulate them. Mm -hmm. But they can have reasons for what they believe. And I think in that regard, they're a fairly good parallel to uh, human unsophisticated subjects, children, yeah. uh, people who've never done a lick of overt philosophy in their lives. They still have reasons for what they believe. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you ask them, they're able to come up with some of those reasons. They may not be as articulate about it. They may not have the vocabulary for expressing them that you or I might reach for. Mm -hmm. But I think people often do have reasons. Think of the phenomenon that's now just a sort of cultural byword of woman's intuition, mm -hmm. right? I yeah. think very frequently uh, women, and it's not restricted to women, but many women, more than men probably, have an instinctive grasp of certain actual features that lie within their awareness that make them say, okay, this person is creepy. Mm -hmm. They might not be able to tell you what they're remembering about other people they later found to be creepy that is similar with these people, but there's just something off. Yeah, And sometimes they'll tell you that and Six months later, you'll discover, okay, that guy was doing X, Y, or Z. Wow, that really was a shady character. Yeah. And you wonder, how did they do it? I think they're picking up on things tacitly, but they're not finding a vocabulary in which to marshal them, regiment them, say, all right, here in standard form are my premises. That's not how we work in ordinary life, yeah. which is fine, at least not unless you're a member of the McGrew household, that <laughs> often we do. But if they are simply saying, hey, you know, um, there's just something wrong here. We learn to pay attention to them. We learn to pay attention to them through a process of seeing that in a fairly high proportion of cases, they turn out to be verifiably right after the fact. And once people have established a track record like that, mm -hmm. we start listening. But the fact is they could not just sit down right now and tell you all of the reasons and put it into some kind of formal system that doesn't mean they don't have reasons. That doesn't mean they're not picking up on real things. Okay. So having reasons, actual reasons, and being reflective and articulate enough to give those verbally to a, a third party, that's those are two different things. Yeah. And so Theophilus, I think, can have reasons. And the reasons are such as Theophilus limited uh, capacities might lead you to think, but they might also include things you wouldn't pick up on if you were in the same room with Theophilus, right? He can smell things you can't smell. Right. He can hear things you can't hear. And some of those might be part of that evidence. So yeah, you know, at, at least two and a half cheers for the rationality of dogs. Even yeah. the old uh, Stoics thought that dogs could do logic. Chrysippus said, you know, you're, a dog is chasing a rabbit and comes to a three-way fork in the path. He sniffs at the first fork he sniffs at the second fork and then he runs down the third one without sniffing. Hmm. Well, he's just done a kind of a, you know, disjunctive trilemma yeah. argument, right? Not A, not B, therefore C. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I get the point. And I think, although no doubt dogs like human beings sometimes fall prey to fallacies, sometimes suffer from their own unconscious biases, nevertheless, yeah, they, they have reasons. Yeah. And so do we. And so does grandma. And so do you children. Um, yeah. So that that would be my take on it. That's that's really helpful. Yeah. So they can have reasons even if they don't uh, if they can't formalize them at the moment. Yeah. And and I guess there are times when my dog has beliefs that aren't justified too. probably whatever's going on in his fuzzy head. Um, so it sure. doesn't he doesn't have to be like a, a perfect rational agent or anything like that. I don't think he is. Yeah, um, that's yeah, that's really good. So uh I'm really interested in this. Um, you, you call it your uh, internalist response to get your problems, uh, and, mm -hmm. and 
and it, it came from uh, Bertrand Russell initially, I believe, or or was yours significantly different enough from Russell's? Uh, so Lydia and I were discussing this way back in the years when I was in graduate school. So we're going back three decades now. <laughs> yeah. And this is what we came up with. And then we went back and looked at Russell and said, oh, gosh, in a certain respect, Russell has anticipated this. But mm -hmm. we refined it and published it and then took a paper that we had published and worked it into a chapter of our book. And so that is sort of the genesis of this. But it all goes back a long time to a period where philosophers were deeply concerned, at least a certain subset of philosophers, with the Gettier problem, with whether internalism needed to be supplemented, modified, abandoned. Uh, I think the Gettier problem served as a, a problem that made a lot of people worried. Mm. So the basic problem, it runs like this. It seems according to certain scenarios that Gettier sketches, that it is possible to have a true justified belief that is not knowledge. Yeah. So he sketches cases where you have a belief. Your belief is, in fact, true. You have a reason for it. Your reason isn't the reason that it's true. There's some other reason that it's true. And because of that failure of your reason to be the right reason, it seems you don't have knowledge. So you're uh, nervous sitting in a waiting room, waiting for a job interview. Uh, another guy who is also waiting for a job interview um, is fiddling with the change. He's pulled it out of his pocket. He sets them out on the coffee table in front of him and moves them around and he's got 37 cents. He's got a quarter, he's got a dime, he's got a couple of pennies. Mm -hmm. And you think to yourself, this guy, I don't know, he just seems more articulate, more put together. He dressed better for this interview than I did. I think he's gonna get the job. So you form the belief, the person who gets the job has 37 cents mm -hmm. on his person. Unbeknownst to you, you're gonna get the job. Also unbeknownst to you, you have 37 cents in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, oh, um, hmm, right. So you had a belief it was true. The person who gets the job does have 37 cents in his pocket. You had a reason for it. The reason even seemed like a good one. All the other things seem to be pointing to the other guy. But in fact, it was not the right reason. It doesn't seem like you have knowledge. Yeah. So Gettier sketches a number of scenarios. They're all quite similar to this and then it just explodes after him and everyone comes up with their own i think i think um going back to russell didn't russell have the broken clock uh like get your pre get your case didn't he list that or maybe it was someone else yeah it, russell's got the um case uh that the prime minister of great britain has a name that begins with a b mm. and he's got somebody who thinks that it's uh, arthur balfour but it's really henry campbell bannerman yeah. but you know, and he had a reason to think that he had read it somewhere. It's, it, you know, Balfour was a statesman. He just sort of got wrong. Who's the prime minister at the present time? But he got right the bit about his having a name that began with B. And Russell says, of course, that's not knowledge. But that's because he got there through believing something and using that as a premise that was, in fact, false. Although he had reasons for it, it was just wrong. Yeah. So that actually i think is a it's a good anticipation of the fuller correct solution but the way that we have developed this it goes beyond just the no false lemma kind of approach which was one of the early approaches in early responses to gettier and uh it involves further commitments but that's okay because i think those commitments are correct yeah well i'm glad you brought that up because that was something i was uh i was meaning to ask you about uh is the the distinction between yours and the no false lemmas view uh, because I, I i do see a similarity but I, i'm just not sure uh the difference there so yeah can you lay out the uh internalist foundationalist response to get your problems sure so the way that lydia and i do this in our book and the way that we hammered out uh can be viewed as a kind of a recursive solution mm -hmm. to the question so we're foundationalists we think there are things that you know without inference that's a starter set so we don't have to give an account of how those get justified by inference from other things. Those things, we have arguments yeah. that they are, in fact, things that you know and, in fact, know incorrigibly, independent of 
inference that you might set up that would connect them with other things. It's not you couldn't set up such inferences, but that's not the ground of your belief. Yeah. Um, once we do that, then we say um, some things are known directly. Everything else that is known is justified. Notice we don't say deduced from or derived deductively from, just justified by hmm. known premises. Now, when you're defining knowledge in terms of the word known, you might get worried, hey, is there a circularity? But since this is a recursive definition, it actually doesn't have that circularity problem. Hmm. Let me give an analogy outside of epistemology. If I ask yeah. you, hey, Parker, how would you define the set of your ancestors? You might say, well, it's like my parents and my grandparents and so on. But the and so on isn't really well defined yet, right? Yeah, right. So here's a recursive way of doing it. My parents are among my ancestors. So my parents count as ancestors. Mm -hmm. Step number two, every parent of an ancestor of mine is an ancestor of mine. Mm -hmm. That's not a circular definition, but it constructs a kind of ladder that we can climb up. Okay, oh. so right now that's going to catch my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents on all. Yeah, you know, that's just going to fan out and that's going to cover it perfectly. Yeah. So the way that we define knowledge is to say there are some things that we know without inference and everything that we know inferentially is justified from premises that are known. Yeah. We argue that all Gettier cases fall before this criterion. Hmm. They're all cases where the belief fails to be justified by known premises. Hmm. And so what we do in that paper, which turned into that chapter of the book, is we just run through a bunch of the most widely cited attempts to undermine it. Now, notice what we've done here. The concept of knowledge, the concept of truth, uh, the concept of justification, the way we parse these out, these are all internalistically acceptable notions. We haven't had to reach for something that's distinctively externalist anywhere. Mm. Yeah. And so, in a sense, what we're showing is that the internalist's toolkit is sufficient to provide us the resources to answer this problem without reaching outside of that toolkit. We don't need to reach for proper function. We don't need to reach for reliable indicator. We don't need to reach for causal relations. This toolkit has everything that is necessary for us to address Gettier problems and come out with both an answer and an answer that is intuitively satisfying. At least to us, your mileage may vary. Uh, that's life and philosophy, but <laughs> we are satisfied with it. Yeah. Um, so you make this distinction that that sounds really good. The, it fails to be justified by known premise. So you make this distinction um, between two types of justification: justification one and justification two. And justification one is like has to do with like just being rational, and justification mm -hmm. two. Well, maybe you can lay it out for us better than than I could do right now. Sure. This is a something that goes all the way back to Herodotus. Uh, Herodotus, the Greek historian, says there's uh, nothing better uh, for a man to do than to take counsel. For if he turns out having taken counsel to be wrong, he's merely unfortunate. But mm -hmm. it was the reasonable thing to do. Okay. Whereas if without taking counsel, he turns out to be right by accident, he receives that which he had no right to expect. Yeah. Right. That's good. So the, the idea here is that justification as a matter of rationality is a wholly internal matter. It's a matter of what you have access to. Yes, we may need to ask the question, what would this look like if the subject were not Theophilus, but were rather someone who was fully online, Johnny Wide Awake, to use uh, Watkins' uh, metaphor, somebody who is, has a, an explicit awareness of all that's going on back there and doesn't have to sit and reflect for a few decades on what it is that he's thinking about. So yeah. or phenomenological transparency. Okay. Uh, but if you don't have good reasons and you nevertheless have just stupid good luck, mm -hmm. that doesn't make you rational. And we wouldn't say that you are justified in that sense. Yeah. Now, the reason 
that some people feel uncomfortable with this is something that Bertrand Russell brings up when he talks about non-frequentist approaches to probability. He says, look, um, what's the connection between being rational and being successful? Mm -hmm. We want a connection and we want a connection that's going to pan out sometime before the sun goes nova. We want something that definitely says that if you are rational, you will be right more often than not. Yeah. After all, I mean, that's one of the ways that we would try to talk about deductive inference, right? Suppose yeah. somebody says to you, you know, Parker, um, I think I know what deduction is and I know what truth is and I prefer believing truth to being an error. Mm -hmm. So, and I accept the premises of your deductive argument, but but why should I accept the conclusion just because of that? And you say, well, because if you do, then if you are in fact right about the premises, you will never be wrong in accepting this conclusion. Yeah. It seems like it would be a tidy thing to be able to do in parallel with that to say uh, to someone who asked the same question about non-deductive reasoning, right? I, I prefer truth to error. I accept these premises as unproblematic. I see that if these premises are true, this conclusion is probable, but why should I accept it? Um, you would like to be able to say something like, well, because most of the time you will in fact turn out to be right. But we can't say that. There's always a residual probability, mm. however small, that you won't be. I can know that a coin is fair. I can know that that means there's less than one chance in a thousand I'm gonna get 10 heads in a row if I flip this 10 times. And yet it's possible that I get 10 heads in a row. It's not the way to bet, but yeah. it is a possibility. Yeah. And so this kind of worry, I think, bothers some people who have externalist intuitions. And the internalist response is just, that's the wrong way to go about it because you're yoking rationality to success in a way that it oughtn't be yoked. Yeah. Uh, I, if I say to you, because you probably won't be wrong, probably there does not mean this proportion of successes to that proportion of tries. Right. It means something that is entirely a matter of the internal structure of the argument and whatever relations of probabilifying there may be among the premises and the conclusion. And that is the move that we isolate and we're willing to make and we're willing to stand on. What we are looking for here is rationality. Success cannot be externally nailed down unless you're going to go externalist. And that's a direction that we think generates extremely serious skeptical problems. Yeah. So we're not going to go there. Yeah. Okay. So, so in, in distinguishing between um, justification one and justification two, this is where I was Initially, just thinking, this seems really similar to no false lemmas because, yeah, uh, if you have a false lemma, then you're just you're using justification one when you should be using justification two. Does that does that do you see where I'm getting at? Do you see why it, yeah, it, it is very similar? But notice that with the recursive uh, approach, where we say some things are known without inference, uh, everything else that is known is justified in terms of things that are items of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Notice that what we are doing there is going beyond the no false lemma approach and actually locking ourselves into what we're very happy to be locked into, which is a version of foundationalism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. You can be a no false lemma guy without being a foundationalist. Okay. But our approach ties the two together. Now, is, is that a bug or a feature? From hmm. our point of view, that's a feature, right? That, yeah. yeah, that's good because independently, foundationalism is correct and we can argue that it's correct. Yeah. If you are allergic to foundationalism or deeply worried about foundationalism, you may worry about that move. But whether you're worried about it or not, that's a feature of our view that makes it both more committal and I think more robust hmm. than the no false lemmas view. So it's, it just goes a little further. It takes us a little further out. And yet, in our view, it ties things together in a really satisfying package because yeah. it allows you to see that there's a kind of architecture going on here, hence the title 
of the book and that this architecture is one that is done completely with foundationalist, internalist, acceptable tools. And that kind of ties the package together. A yeah. lot of people try to talk about the Gettier problem without talking about internalism, or if they do, only to dismiss internalism and leap for some things that have external ties to truth. And since we think all of those views are extremely deeply troubling, we are really happy to be able to present a unified view yeah. that gives an internalist solution here in a way that links it back into the foundationalism, which we independently find plausible. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I like to see the the package deal. So with with no false lemmas, um, I believe that's that's like a fourth condition. So in in order to have knowledge, you need justified true belief, and you need no false lemmas. So you no no false uh, lemma is like a step in the argument. Uh, you can't have any false ones there. So it's it's got four conditions for knowledge. Um, do you do you guys have four? Do, does the justification count as two, or is it just yeah? Standard no, three? we don't. We don't really. So notice that the no false lemmas thing is something that might lie for all that it is being said there. It might lie completely outside the scope of your knowledge to realize right. that there are false lemmas here and no false lemmas there. Right. Whereas the way that we do it, we say there's a definition of justification and it's a two-step definition because it's recursive. There are things that are justified without inference or things that are inferentially justified. They're justified in virtue of premises that are themselves known. Mm. And so that allows us, in the same way that the definition of ancestor does, to construct a ladder backwards uh, down the, the the backdrop of our beliefs to the things that are foundational. Yeah. Um, so it's all going to be tied into things that lie within your awareness. And the No False Lemmas view seems to us to be incomplete, if stated thus baldly, because it leaves the lack of falsehood for those things a little underdeveloped. Is this just sky hooked? How do we do right. this? Are there only certain kinds of things that we could accept as lemmas where we wouldn't be at risk of having them be false? If so, which ones would those be? How could we tell? Is there a regress that threatens here? And we just cut it all off and we say, okay, here we've got a, a version of foundationalism, point to some of my earlier work. Uh, there are things that you can take to the bank. There are things that you literally cannot believe in the way that we stipulate and be mistaken about yeah um that's yeah. that's that's really good i've always i've always um i think probably nate a couple of years ago to nate Lawfer for those listening uh he's awesome i always mention him but i think he probably introduced me to no false numbers a few years ago and i, I kind of thought like it was like a kind of a i don't want to say a hand wave because i don't be rude but it's like uh, no false lemmas. Also, it's kind of like an add-on. Like, okay, that, and that's I a, like yours a quick more... and dirty way of getting there. I just yeah. think that it's more. It's better to put it in the recursive terms. Yeah, that's what I like about yours because it seems like a more principled, uh, fleshed out right. uh, view. Maybe we can. Can we apply? Uh, can we apply your solution to the Gettier case um, back to the the uh, job application case, just so people can see? Because we we all we all most of us should think. Some someone out there might not. Uh, that look, I don't have knowledge that I got the job or, or, uh, I, the knowledge, the justified true belief that he who has 36 cents in his, in his pocket will get the job. Wasn't just, uh, wasn't knowledge for me. Can you help us see based off of your criteria, why that's not knowledge? Right. So the way the scenario is sketched, I have no information, no access to information about the coinage that happens to reside in my pocket. Right. What, is making it reasonable for me to believe this about whoever it is that gets the job is the fact that this guy has this money and I think he's the one, mm -hmm. right? But that belief, though it may be a reasonable belief for me to hold, is not justified, um, uh, let, let's say, it's since it's a falsehood, it's it's justified by something that I do have access to, right? He's got these coins, mm. he's a natty dresser, he seems to me to be more articulate and have better background than I, and so on. Um, but I'm wrong about that. And then my further belief, the person who gets the job interview has such and such amount of change in his pocket. That further belief is ha has no justification except that which is routed through the false belief 
that he's going to get the job. Yeah. So there's where the no false lemmas connection shows up, mm -hmm. where our position is just a little bit fuller and richer is that it says the reason that that belief that he's going to get the job doesn't qualify as knowledge uh, or doesn't qualify as a reason that gives me knowledge about the person having this much pocket change is that in fact uh my belief about the person who's going to get the job having this much pocket change is not justified on the basis of premises i know that mm. bit isn't known because it isn't true and so it there's a breakage there now I might have been over justified, different scenario. I also mm. noticed that I have 37 cents in my pocket. I figure surely they're gonna hire one or the other of us. Okay, that's a different matter, yeah, right? Yeah. But once we say that, we're changing the scenario. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the direction that the analysis would go there is to say, since you don't in fact know that he's gonna get the job because he isn't, you don't have justification that comes only from known premises for the person who gets the job has this much pocket change yeah that's great man I'm, uh, that's that was so helpful i love that i'm gonna have to chew on that some more but i no wanted to, i wanted to um so so we've kind of fleshed out like okay here's why internalism isn't crazy and here's why i can actually explain uh and do some positive lifting here but i want to i want to take a little polemical stance here and then uh sure. raise your uh, meta regress for uh externalism um mm -hmm. Can you, can you help us out? What is the meta regress for externalism? Sure. So let's compare this to the old fashioned realism inspired by some comments, uh, the, the regress argument inspired by some comments of Aristotle, uh, which is that the uh, object level reasons that we give, uh, I, you, I believe A, why do you believe A? Because B, why do you believe B? Because C and D and so on. Um, that's the ordinary regress and foundationalism is the position that it, such sets of questions and answers ultimately terminate after a finite number of steps in something that you know without having some other reason for it. Yeah. The meta regress is a problem that arises when we start focusing not on my belief that I'm going to get this job or someone so has this kind of car or things of that type, but rather on the principles of inference that license us in moving from certain premises to other conclusions. Mm -hmm. So the in the discipline, these are called epistemic principles. And following, I think it was James Van Cleve who first used this terminology, mm -hmm. we distinguish between uh, generative epistemic principles and transmissive epistemic principles. Okay. So let's focus for the moment on transmissive epistemic principles. These are patterns of reasoning that license you in moving from x y and z to some conclusion c now the licensing may be deductive or non-deductive it doesn't have to be uh strictly a deductive thing and in fact i would say very frequently it is not okay but those patterns of inference can themselves become things that we ask questions about we can as we say in logic pop up to the meta level yeah. and start asking questions not about specific propositions, but about in deduction, it might be modus ponens. In non-deductive inference, it might be Bayes' theorem. Mm -hmm. Now, for the internalist of our stripe at any rate, these epistemic principles are going to be matters that we can come to know decisively without an infinite series of other principles by which we infer them. Um, and that's good because there are lots of cases where we would worry a lot about attempting to appeal to a principle of inference or a method of arriving at beliefs to justify the method of arriving at beliefs. Yeah. So I'll give a silly example and then I'll give a more serious example. And then I'll try to parse what's going on. The silly example, um, there's a woman in my town who makes a living doing all kinds of uh, crystal ball reading, tarot card reading, right? Yeah. If she promises for forty nine ninety five to give you an answer to a question about your love life by looking in her crystal ball, and you say, uh, "Hang on, just a minute. Wait, why? Why are we looking in a crystal ball? Why should we think that that's a good method for coming up 
with the truth. And she says, I'll tell you, but that'll be another 50 bucks. <laughs> so we shell out another 50 bucks. And she says, okay, hang on. And she picks up her crystal ball and turns it a little bit and says, yes, yes, I see here that crystal ball gazing is reliable. We're going to say, I've been robbed, right? This is a, this is a chip. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering about whether crystal ball gazing is reliable. You can't just look in your crystal ball, tell me what you see, and expect me to then accept that. I had questions about looking in a crystal ball. Yeah. Right? It wouldn't solve the problem if she says, no, no, no. I'll look in my second crystal ball here and see whether looking in the first one is reliable. Right. Well, now I got questions about your second crystal ball. And the fact that she has a limitless supply of these to look into, although it does raise questions about actual infinities, doesn't mm -hmm. resolve my epistemological problem. Like, uh, now I'm, you're just moving from one thing I had doubt about to something else I had equal problems with. Yeah. So this is a method of saying, yes, yes, this other method is okay. Now, in logic, sometimes we try to illustrate why modus ponens, this, this belief structure, if P then Q, mm -hmm. P, therefore Q, is a valid inference form, one where if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. So yeah. suppose I argue for modus ponens this way. I say, look, when you create the corresponding conditional to modus ponens and you do a truth table for it, the truth table is a tautology. And if the truth table for the corresponding conditional is a tautology, then the inference is valid. Right. So it's valid. What have I done? I've given you an argument, but my argument has the very structure, modus ponens, mm -hmm. that we're talking about. Right. And so if you had a problem uh, with that or a question about that, I haven't really done something that is going to resolve your question because I've just appealed to the same form of inference again. Am I saying there's something wrong with modus ponens? No, I am not saying that. Am right. I saying that if we know that modus ponens is valid, then although it may be useful to jog people's intuitions in this way, we ultimately know it by some means other than constructing a modus ponens structured argument. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Oh, so Dr. McGrew, and you're, yeah, you're using, yeah. I know you're using this as an analogy, um, and so I don't want to get too off track. But I have to bring this up because we, we we thought about Aristotle already. What, what about like Aristotle and the law of non-contradiction and his? Some people have called it a transcendental argument. And it's um, it, it's justified because you can't not use it. What would you make of of his uh, argument there about non-contradiction? Right. So you're you're looking at maybe the arguments from metaphysics book Gamma mm -hmm. there, and I think what Aristotle is doing is illustrating the practical impossibility of doing without it. Okay. Um, I, I think it was, uh, Epictetus who did something similar with logic in general. He was about mm -hmm. to give a set of lectures on logic and somebody called out, prove to me that logic is useful. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, you want me to prove that logic is useful? Yeah. Prove that it's useful. Hmm. Okay. And if I do that, I'm going to have to give you an argument, right? Yeah. You're going to have to give me an argument. And that had better be a logical argument, shouldn't it? Yeah, it's going to have to be a logical argument. And, you know, Epictetus has seen this trap coming from a mile away. Yeah. And he says, how are you going to know if I'm bullshitting you? Yeah. And there's no answer. And he says, see how important logic is? Mm. See how useful it is? Without it, you can't even tell whether logic is useful. Yeah. Which is a lovely answer. I think Aristotle's pulling a similar move there. But ultimately... The point that lies behind the move is for at least some of these things, you just see it. This is what we call meta foundationalism. Okay. There is no further place, no further point where we go to say, oh, but, you know, I just, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the structure of this reasoning and I just don't know whether this is rational. I need something else to help me for some things. It's just transparent at the bottom. And if you have somebody who's going to be a, a verbal troll and say, oh, I don't get it. The best thing that you can do is to use one of these transcendental arguments to try to show, if not him, then at least the other people who might be listening in, that this is not really a reasonable question. Yeah. So it's not it's not necessarily like established by a transcendental argument. That's just showing that like this is that's it's refuting the objection, but it's maybe it's it's just rationally intuited. It's it's 
we don't always see by rational intuition all of the things that we might. Okay. Right. When, when a great mathematician like the Indian prodigy Ramanujan sees that a certain number is the smallest number that can be expressed as the sum of three cubes in two different ways or something crazy like that. You know, I, I'm just like, oh, you just see that, right? So there are some things some people see and other people don't. Mm -hmm. When there's something that really is rationally compelling, but for some reason, someone's finding it a little difficult to see, we try to build intuition pumps and yeah. use other means to bring them to the point of seeing that and there's nothing wrong with doing that as long mm -hmm. as we don't fall into the trap of saying we ourselves have no other way of showing that anything is a rationally uh, compelling form of reasoning or method of arriving at beliefs other than using some method of arriving at beliefs and saying that it, no sometimes you just stop and you say i see this yeah. this one really is valid mm -hmm. and if someone else can't see it there's a limit to how much you can do to help you can try to give transcendental arguments you can try to do intuition prompts you can try to give maybe concrete examples like when i have students who are having trouble wrestling with the definition of the material conditional logic, the if P then Q that we use in symbolic logic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll, I'll say, well, consider this case. I tell you, if you apply for this job, we will hire you. Under what condition would you say what I told you is false? And the only one is you do apply for the job, but we don't hire you. Yeah. And I use that to help them to get the feel that it's not too crazy to fill the T's and the F's in a truth table in this way. Right. The concrete example helps some people, whereas the abstract if P then Q just seem to be floating around in some kind of, you know, Plato's purgatory, I'll call it, a place <laughs> where there are these abstract things, but we're not quite sure that they're friendly. Um, right. But you make it concrete, it's easier to grasp. So we look for ways of making these things easier to grasp. But okay. in the end, those are just stepping stones, aids, they're not the fundamental insight itself. That's that's so helpful. Thanks thanks for letting me take that little uh, regress there. But back back to the the meta regress. Um, so you, I took us on a tangent, but you were you were using that to as an intuition pump in order to uh, then lay out the the meta regress for the external. Right. So if if your way of vindicating some principle of reasoning is a way that does not come to rest in a principle that is itself uh, intuitively clear, mm -hmm. then we're off to the races. Yeah. Uh, then you gotta use a different one to show that principle B is. So I'm using principle B to argue that principle A is a good one, using principle C to argue for B, I use principle D to argue for C. If this set of sort of arguments about principles doesn't come to rest somewhere, then we have a really skept deep form of skepticism, a, a troubling form of skepticism, where we wind up never really being able to give a decisive answer to the question, but is this reasonable? Mm. Um, it, it, at the object level, it's very easy to give trivial examples. Um, for the meta level, if you allow something that has no intrinsic structure that makes it credible, like crystal ball reading, yeah. To do the job at one level, then why can't I raise that same question about crystal ball reading? And uh, like I said, the fact that you can move over to something that has the same set of problems. Well, I'm reading crystal ball two now, or I'm laying out tarot cards for this, or I'm going to throw some sticks and see how they fall, or I'm going to read chicken entrails. And if you're just going to keep going and going and going, and there's nothing that ever has an intrinsically compelling answer, it's yeah. always going to be a question deferred, then... We argue this is not a satisfying answer to skepticism, mm -hmm. right? So go to the end of the third volume of Planica's Warrant Trilogy, right? But is it true? Well, all I can say, he says, is that it seems to me to be true and it seems to me to be the most important truth. Yeah. And that's all you got? Um, truly, anybody might do that from any other perspective, surely a Mormon could do his own version of that. And if all you have to say is, yeah, but we're right and you're wrong, hmm. then I think this is a problem. Planning doesn't think it's a problem, I do. Well, especially if you can't tell 
why it's why you're right and they're wrong right and that's that's more the internalist condition of like well here's my evidence or evidential foundationalist yeah all that right because if all you're appealing to is the strength of your inner conviction which inner conviction does not have any rational connection that an internalist could parse out yeah to the truth then i you know look i'm not a mormon but I believe them when they say that they have strong internal senses of conviction. Yeah. Burning in the bosom. Yeah. Right. I, I, I don't see any reason at all to think they're lying. Sure. So I think that leaves us in a really bad spot. I don't think we should go there. And I think that it's kind of distressing to be left with nothing better to say. But yes, but if we're right and you're wrong, then our beliefs are formed properly and your beliefs are not formed properly so there yeah uh, that doesn't that doesn't do the job of answering these questions that made epistemology interesting to me in the first place right so from a foundationalist perspective there are there are certain beliefs that uh that you know without inference does the belief that god exists does that um could that classify as as one of those um or or is that too broad of a, a foundation I don't know what it would be like for that to be something known without inference. Mm. Uh, I am reluctant to say God himself could not give me such awareness of his existence that I would not require any grounds for it. But I'm not sure what that would look like. I'm just I'm a little baffled. Would it just be a very strong predilection to believe this thing i don't think we should just back up onto the pure phenomenology of the strength of the sense of rightness yes yes this is right this is the thing uh, i think we need something else and so in developing foundationalism i have tried to make an argument that there are certain kinds of beliefs that cannot be wrong because of the way that they are formed mm. um, I, I am experiencing like this the demonstrative picks out an aspect of my experience. I can't form that belief if there's no aspect of my experience being picked out. Yeah. And if I form it that way, I am right. I then need to argue that this is not the same thing as I am experiencing however I am experiencing, which is just tautological, right? Yeah. So that's fine. I, I need to give an account there, and I think I do. But you can't make belief that God exists much less belief that Christianity is true, the great truths of the gospel fit into that mold. So if you're going to try to argue, no, these are good places to stop, then you're going to have to give us some other kind of account as to why those are good places to stop. Yeah. I understand that there are people who have a hard time seeing what it would be like for Christianity to be, to be false. I talked to a guy, a friend of mine, uh, we were hanging in a coffee shop once, and I asked him, well, why do you think Christianity is true? He knew I was a Christian. He, I, I wasn't trying to pull his chain, but I just asked him that question. And he looked at me, he was kind of baffled. He said, well, how could it not be? Mm. Not a satisfying answer. I think that if that's all you have to say, then I'm worried about what's going to happen when you get into conversation with somebody who knows full well how Christianity could fail to be true, might not be uh, a creator of the universe, might be a creator, but he's not interested in what human beings are doing, didn't send his son to die on the cross. It's, you know, there's a lot of ways Christianity could turn out to be false that we can at least describe. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you need something more than that, not something more than that to be a Christian. When yeah. Jesus says, you know, whosoever comes to me i you know, i'm not going to cast him out he doesn't add an asterisk saying provided your epistemology is really really good right god condescends he accepts us with all of our failings which are manifold including epistemological failings yeah. so i'm not putting that up as a condition for salvation mm -hmm. but i do think that it's a poor position to be in to have no reasons or even to define yourself into an epistemology that absolves you of giving reasons yeah. for your belief. Yeah. Um, and I say it that way carefully because I know there are people like William Lane Craig who 
say that this is borne home to them by the internal instigation of the Holy Spirit, but they also have arguments. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad that he appeals to arguments because I don't think that the IIHS is going to do the kind of work he thinks it will do. Mm. So we better have the arguments. Yeah. So this is a place where I want to acknowledge people can buy into an externalist epistemology and still have internalist style reasons that they're willing to give. Yeah. But when the chips are down, they want to say, yeah, but it, you know, the final work, the uh, intrinsic defeater defeater uh, for all these things is my direct apprehension of this through the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that I think is not going to work. And I think that that's not a good thing to teach people as being normative. Mm. If you go back in church history and you look at the works of the great Puritan divine Richard Baxter, yep. he has a lot to say about people who make that kind of direct apprehension normal, ordinary to the cognitive life of all believers. Yeah. He calls that, and it's not. A, he's, this is not an endorsement. He says, this seems to me a direct expectation of enthusiasm. Huh. You, are, you are saying, all right, everybody who's really a Christian has to just gin it up like this. Yeah. Oh, man. It's such a slam um, coming from back then saying it's, it, it's enthusiasm. It's like, oh, dude, like that's, uh, that's bad. Right. So this is from his book, The Saints Everlasting Rest. If you want to put a reference in the show notes, I can send it to you afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, just a, a question about um, acquaintance knowledge. Like, so I, I know my mom, um, and maybe maybe you could give me a bunch of arguments for why she doesn't exist. But at the end of the day, I'm like, well, I, I think I'm like directly acquainted with. I think I know her. Is that is that still inferential knowledge? Do I still, or or is is acquaintance knowledge of another person like that? Is that direct? So the the vocabulary of knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description. Uh, has its most ordinary language roots in our being acquainted with persons and objects. Like, yeah, I know this is my mom. I'm not, I'm not wrong about this. Mm -hmm. When we apply it in an extremely refined epistemological way like this, and we say, okay, there are some things we know by acquaintance, we narrow the scope of that to things that lie within our field of awareness directly. Mm. Now, if you are a, what is called a direct realist, yeah, you will maintain, I am aware of objects, mm -hmm. persons, directly. If you are an indirect realist, you say, well, I am aware of this structure of my experience, which is thus and not otherwise. And the best explanation of that is there's such and such a person who is my mom, who right. loves me, who makes killer chocolate chip cookies. And, you know, that's yeah. so the epistemological refinement of that narrows the scope of that term acquaintance to things that lie within your phenomenological reach. There are aspects of things that you can be directly aware of. And since I am an indirect realist or a representative realist in, in the Lockean sense of that term, don't agree with everything Locke says on this, but on that point, I think he's generally right. Um, I would want to reserve that for something really narrow. In the rough and ready everyday sense, I have no trouble saying, you know, I'm acquainted with my wife, you're acquainted with Theophilus, whatever. That yeah. That's fine for everyday language. But when somebody says, yes, but couldn't you be deceived by a Cartesian demon? Couldn't you be a hapless mind in a simulation? Couldn't you be a brain in a vet? Then I think that we need to go somewhere else in order to try to give a an answer to those things that is fully satisfying and doesn't just take the questions they're raising too lightly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I was thinking about, you know, the next move would be to say, well, I'm directly acquainted with God or, or, um, that, that's kind of a strong claim. Cause it'd be like at this moment, phenomenologically. And I, I think I'm probably with you with the indirect realism. It's, it's kind of like impious in the, the, a lot of the Christian circles I'm in where it's like, no direct realism. And you're like almost the bad guy for being like, oh, I have some questions here. Yeah. As far as direct awareness of God as something that is that you're you constantly have if you're, you know, what what the the experience of devout Christians through the ages has been that sometimes you feel very close to God and you might even say, because it seems to be the best way of expressing it, that you're sort of aware of his presence. And other times 
it seems like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and coming back into the room, right? Sometimes you feel like, yeah, this is it. And sometimes you don't. And I think it's a very serious mistake for us to say, well, if you don't, then you might not be a Christian. So you got to worry about that. Right. Because what you're basically saying to a lot of people who are sincere believers is you don't have the kind of experience that you should have if you were really a Christian. Right. Now, Alvin Plantinga claimed to have had some direct experiences of God. And what do I know? Right. I'm willing to grant that perhaps there was something between Alvin and the Almighty that some of the rest of us are not into. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not in a strong position to say what he might or might not have had. I don't know what it would be like, but I, I don't feel like I should go out and pronounce on it. What mm -hmm. I will say, and I will say quite definitely, is that not only I, but a lot of others I've talked to just don't have that and certainly don't have that as a constant feature of our lives. Yeah. Okay. Um, for us, I think words of the psalmist, right? Do not hide your face from me. This is not a cry from someone who's constantly beholding the face of God. Right. Right. Yeah. How long will you be angry with me forever? This is, this is someone who realizes that his access to God is something that doesn't always bring that direct awareness to mm -hmm. the fore. I think we have to take that kind of stuff seriously. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. So, so yeah, so, so you can't just jump to direct awareness to escape. Um, but so in, in dealing with the uh, regress that's posed against the internalist, uh, you get you and your wife go in for uh, Locke's doctrine of intuition, that there are occasions in which, um, yeah, we are infallible in our beliefs. Is that, is that right? Or am I mischaracterizing that? Yeah, I, that, that's a good first approximation. Okay. Um, a little more specifically, I would say that there are some claims, some propositions I cannot bring fully to my consciousness without in the act of doing it, being aware that they are true. It, does the Kagi token so this? Uh, it, yeah, I, I think we could go with Descartes, uh, I am. Nice. Uh, I think there are four I am, which we can also go back to Augustine, right? Augustine yeah, see, sum. says to see, follow sum, right? Uh, if I am deceived, then at least I'm around to be being deceived. And so, so yeah. what I can't be deceived about is whether I exist, because if I'm wrong about that, then there's an I, which means I'm not wrong about that. So no. Yes. And I think Descartes probably uh, consciously or unconsciously was borrowing from Augustine on that okay. point. So, yeah, I, I think that would be something. Um, if you want a mathematical example, let's, you know, some of us are too well aware that we can make mistakes in mathematics, but how about one <laughs> equals one? Mm -hmm. Are we down with that? Hmm. Do, do we realize that if you, if you grasp what one means, and if you grasp what equals means, then you're going to see that this has to be a truth. Mm -hmm. Um, if you don't see that it's a truth, you say, well, I, I see you're claiming that one equals one, but I'm not sure that's right. Then you don't get what one means or you don't get what equals means. There's something wrong with your understanding of the meaning of that. If you can understand it and have doubt about it, eh, you're not really understanding it. I, I think that's right. I, I wonder about like the, the naturalized logician type dudes who, who go in for like subclassical logics and stuff where they're like, yeah, you know. Maybe we can have contradictions and maybe, you know, the law of identity is not what we think. I don't know if they go in for the law of identity, but they definitely go after the other two. Yeah, I, I like uh, the old British neo-Hegelian McTaggart on this point. No man <laughs> ever broke the rules of logic, but what the rules of logic broke him. Sorry, guys. <laughs> you know, you, you can play these games, but when you do, you will find that the only way to do so consistently is by altering definitions and the definition alterations that you make will be made in the service of the one inescapable kind of consistency mm. that in the end to construct a non-classic logic and say, oh, but I'm going to like block certain kinds of moves that use these symbols in this order. All right, you're redefining some of the symbols so that you can get away with this. And I, look, let a thousand flowers bloom as far as people wanting to give different definitions to squiggles. I, sure. I have no investment about that, but let's not call these rival systems of logic. Yeah. Nobody they're like different games. Has ever, 
Bingo. Yeah. Nobody's ever come up with something that, in my view, is truly a rival system of logic and isn't just flat out no unacceptable. And I, uh, I, I yeah. looked into this quite a bit when I was a grad student. I was interested in so-called quantum logics and things of that sort. And it just turns out, yeah, you know, there's no distributive lattice underlying these operators like this. But that's because things aren't really meaning the same things that they meant in classical logic. Or we take English subjunctive conditionals and we say, oh, you know, hypothetical syllogism doesn't work with subjunctive conditionals. And we give clever examples. We say, yeah. um, if Oswald hadn't shot Kennedy, Kennedy would have been elected to a second term as president. Plausible. Then we say, if Kennedy had died at the age of one from measles, Oswald would not have shot Kennedy. Also plausible. But we can't go, so if Kennedy had died at the age of one from measles, he would have been elected to a second term as president. We can't chain them together way. Subjunctives don't work like indicatives. Good, yeah. fine. But that's the best evidence we could ask for, that we don't mean the same thing by if A were true, B would be true, and if A is true, B is true. The indicative and the subjunctive conditionals just aren't the same logical beasts. Yeah, that's just yeah, one yeah. way that we tell that. Yeah. Um, Man, I hope this... If this is too much of a rabbit trail or whatever, uh, feel free to pass over. But so when it when it comes to like the liar paradox, um, do you have a do you have a particular uh, solution that you like? I, I'm satisfied with no item uh, theories of that. Okay. Right. So you haven't really said something. You haven't really articulated a proposition when you have framed one of these things in a paradoxical sentence or in a sentence. It's embedded in a system where it can be understood only in a paradoxical way. I'm just like, yeah, those those don't count. So um, that and that's been a classical solution that rules out the construction of certain paradoxes in logic and in set theory. And I'm I'm content with that. I'm aware that there's a vast literature on that. Sure. You can read, you know, Barwise and Echimendi and other people have played around on that front. But that seems to me to be a reasonable way of trying to block yeah. this. That seems right. Yeah. Uh uh, so, we, so we don't have to give up bivalence because, uh, well, is it just nonsense? Is it, it, uh, it, it's, it's like a faux, it's like a faux proposition. It looks like it has content, but it actually doesn't have any content. Yeah, I, th I think it actually doesn't assert a proposition. There we go. It okay. may be something you could play a game with in a different system. But yeah. again, you would have been redefining some of the things, including truth, that you're playing around with there. And if you want to redefine these things, be real explicit. Tell us up front what you're redefining. And then... You know, we can play the game or not if we're interested. But once you start changing the meanings of the fundamental terms here, you're not really constructing a rival to classical bivalent logic. So yeah. I'm I'm very old fashioned on this. Uh, interestingly, in 1990, when I was a graduate student, I met Quine. Hmm. Quine, very famously in his paper, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, yeah. had said that revision even of the logical law of excluded middle has been proposed as a way of simplifying quantum mechanics. And then he goes on to say, and what difference in principle is there between this and, you know, the way that Einstein superseded Newton? And, and the answer is much in every way. It's just, you know, <laughs> it's, well, it's what are you big. talking about? But curiously, in 1990, when I met him at a conference in San Marino, um, Quine was talking openly about what he called stimulus analyticity. Hmm. So he was he was giving in and saying the A word, but he was sort of gluing it up against his preferred behaviorist concept of stimulus in order to draw some of the sting of that. But it, it must have gone hard with him to have to say analyticity at all. But he was already kind of feeling like uh, that position was not maybe not a position he really had wanted to die on. And so he was kind of moving past it. Also, in his book, Philosophy of Logics, if you look through it. Mm -hmm. Quine, having said, oh, we might review, revise anything in his articles, he then looks at various proposals for revising logic, and he doesn't like any of them. He's, he's like, nah, nah, nah. He's, yeah. he's the ultimate grumpy cat when it comes to actual proposals to revise logic. Yeah, just the and, ability. And I, yeah. I wonder if he got ambushed a little bit by logical reality there. Hmm. Uh, and and that was maybe part of what was making him uncomfortable with his earlier large S and saying, well, yeah, we could revise any of this. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, well, Dr. McGrew, just a, just a couple more uh, questions here. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll uh, okay, I work on a college campus. I work for a, a ministry called Athletes in Action. And I'll, sometimes we'll be sharing our faith or whatever, and someone will come up and say, well, 
or I'll be talking with someone and they go, what if we live in a computer simulation? And I've, I've to, to all my listeners chagrin, I've brought it up to, to most of my guests. Um, <laughs> and so we talk about it, but, but oftentimes when I bring that back to other guys that I'm working with, uh, or brain in a vat, they'll say, well, that can't be true. Or the Bible's not true. Or, you know, God wouldn't let us be a brain in a vat. And I think, well, you know, why not? If, 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 if we have a lot of the answers to the problem of evil make it seem like, yeah, God could let us be a brain in a vat. Um, so just initially, I wanted to ask you about that response that like, if we're brains in the vat, is the Bible not true? Is, is Christianity false? If, if you or I were a brain in a vat right now? Okay. So let's, let's back way out. All <laughs> okay. right. Um, Back in the early to mid 18th century, George Barclay put forward a view according to which tables and chairs are real. They're just not the sort of things you thought they were. Right. So he's not denying the reality of tables, chairs, laptop computers. He is, uh, I guess he didn't know about laptops, but he is denying that they are completely independent of all minds whatsoever. Right. So it's this notion of matter as something wholly divorced from mind that he doesn't like. And so he builds a version of idealism. Mm -hmm. In that version of idealism, we still inhabit a world. That world is a world that has tables, chairs, other people's bodies. Uh, and, and we engage with other people in, in this realm. And Christ came in this realm, died for us in this realm rose again in this realm. There are laws that govern how things intersect and interact here. So it is kind of the super simulation view, right? Yeah. There just aren't bodies. You thought that there were these things that would retain all their properties if they weren't elements in any mind whatsoever. That Barclay thinks is nonsense. He has his reasons. We don't have to agree with them to understand yeah. what he's laying out. Couldn't someone have just think... like kicked a stone or something and said, look there, I refuted this or. Yeah. I kicked a what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dear Samuel Johnson, love him, but not perhaps his finest moment as an epistemologist. Right. Um, so what we have there is a situation where all of the claims that you would want to make about the way that the world is in Christianity, as long as they don't invoke the existence of mind independent matter, Barclay's right there with that. And they're all true. And so yeah. I think in that kind of a simulation, if you want to call it simulation, um, Barclay's translation of all of the central historical claims of Christianity, as well as the doctrinal ones, would still be true. Yeah. So the question is their mind independent matter is not one on which the gospel per se must force us right. to a realist position. I am myself a happy realist yeah. and I think Barclay is wrong, okay. but I, I want to say, you know, there's depending on how you're going to lay this out, there is scope for some of these things. Now there's nothing deceptive in Barclay's view about this metaphysical backdrop. Mm -hmm. God is not deceiving us. After all, in order to think about mind independent matter, we would have to be making cognitive mistakes. And so no, it's our fault if we get all tangled up in the Lockean view. It's not God's fault. Yeah. When you when you pull back from that and you do something like you really are just a brain soaking in a vat of nutrients with thousands and tens of thousands of electrode leads coming off and running back to a computer programmed by a super scientist. You know, I guess what I want to say is. Um, this is why we make a distinction between reason beyond all possible doubt and proof beyond all reasonable doubt. Mm. Yeah, there are a lot of things that are barely logically possible that don't deserve equal time, even in a philosophy classroom. Yeah. And so I think that there's no reason whatsoever to think that we are uh, being manipulated in this highly deviant fashion yeah uh any more than that we're being manipulated by a, a malevolent and vastly powerful cartesian deceiver and we don't need to say as descartes wants to say ah but that would be incompatible with the goodness of god yeah uh, i think instead we can say simple things like if there is a super scientist manipulating the inputs that i have experientially 
Um, why does he make it look like this, like a world like this? Hmm. How's it going to look when I go out into the kitchen and I search around for lunch? And if the answer is just exactly the same as it would have looked if there were a real physical world, then honestly, the scenario is piggybacking on the content yes. of realism. But adding an extra step, right? It just doesn't have any content itself. It's just saying, whatever you say the real world is like, I'll say that's what the simulation is like. Well, there's yeah. a lot, you know, why doesn't the, the super scientist get bored? Does he ever go on vacation? Does he ever decide, you know what? I'm just going to make everything in the refrigerator look like cotton candy for the next 24 hours. Yeah. Well, why what I have, which holds together really well within a realist framework, then what I could have had, which is any number of different things. Yeah. Yeah. I want to maybe just hedge off uh, some of the atheists listening who would say, well, then we'll just make that move with theism and say, well, we have this real world. Why add? Doesn't the creator get bored or anything like that? But that's a different scenario because we have different arguments for God's existence. But adding a, 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 another uh, rational agent in between God and us is a, is a different story that we can just cut that out. Yeah. That, would that, you add right? a when you add a wheel to the mechanism that's not connected to any other part of the mechanism, that wheel really is just extra. Okay. But I guess the short way of replying to that would be not every way of simplifying your ontology by cutting some entity out of the loop is actually rationally desirable. Yeah. So, you know, what if I say to you, yeah, well, you don't believe that Tom or Dick or Harry is president of the United States. I just go one president further. <laughs> I don't think there was an Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all Lincolnism, my <laughs> ontology is now leaner than yours, Parker. I yeah. win. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How are you going to make sense of the American Civil War without Abraham Lincoln? Right. The, the supposed gain in simplicity that we gain by kicking an entity out has to be weighed against the trade-off of the explanatory chaos it creates. Yeah. when we omit that thing from our ontology. Yeah. There are more criteria for a, a good metaphysic than simply have I got rid of everything that I can imagine throwing out no matter how convoluted <laughs> and counterintuitive the resulting mess is. That's right. not the way of wisdom in metaphysics. Yeah, there's this like ceteris or ceteris paribus clause that's in, uh, that needs to go in hand, hand in hand with simplicity. Like all things need to be equal and you just right. jacked it up. Curiously, okay. this is mentioned even by Galileo when he's talking about systems of astronomy. It's like, ah, but, you know, it's not just can we do without this, but can we do equally well without okay. this? And that he goes right. and talks about this in his dialogues. Yeah. So there's this question of um, as as the metaverse, whatever that actually picks out, uh, let's say that there is like a possible like it's like the Matrix, I guess, like the metaverse as it becomes approaches the Matrix. Does, does that make it? Uh, like less modally safe for us to believe that we're in base reality, like as it becomes more of a uh, option that we could be uh, in a digital world and and not know it. As that becomes more advanced, does that make it less modally safe to believe that we aren't? I guess I, I'm I'm wrestling a little bit to try to figure out what the question means. Yes. Uh, well, well, you said right. you have no I mean, if, you have no reason to uh, to think that that you're a brain in a vat. But let's see. Let's say like it becomes a viable option, and you see uh, a, an evil. Well, you see a scientist invading brains, and uh, maybe you can even see on the screen what that what that brain is experiencing. Would that make it more plausible? Would that would that mess with your own um, I don't know credence or whatever that you're in base reality? I, I I guess I just have to say I don't think I could render an answer to that question without a much more fully developed scenario. Okay. I want to know what this is like at a detailed level. I want to know the underlying metaphysics that you're importing when you're talking about brains having experiences, because I don't think brains, qua brains, can have experiences. Okay. Right? I'm, you, I'm not you... a materialist. Cool. That's good. I'm, That's I'm good. an old-fashioned dualist. So, nice, man. I uh, like Car that. Cartesian dualism forever. My friend Richard Farmerton many years ago said to me, uh, so, you know, what— what, what kind of metaphysical view do you find most plausible about the nature of persons? And I said, uh, I'm a substance dualist. And he kind of nodded. He said, as soon as I figure out what a substance is, I'll be a substance dualist. Apparently, he's figured it out because he's written a book since then, Defending Substance Dualism. Yeah, nice. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of nice being able 
to have a position that I think is uh, fully compatible with Orthodox Christian theology and just allows you to look at some of these things and say, wait, guys, what are you even saying? Because I, I yeah. don't just think pieces of meat, qua pieces of meat, can have experiences. That doesn't make sense yeah. to me. So we're going to have to talk more about the backdrop for that. What if it's something more like the matrix where, you know, it's your entire nervous system in your body, which is, you know, your soul is, uh, I don't even know the language for it, associated with or connected to or whatever. Like there's no reason for your soul to be uh, disembodied in this case. Yeah. Or, I'd, I'd really like to see like, okay, just what and how extensive is the information mm. that there are people who are really in the matrix? We're not just talking about normal people dreaming now, right? Right. We're talking right. about something with the computational resources to produce uh, a wide range of experiences as of interactions among the different individuals thus slaved up to the right. matrix. Yeah, I'd like to give me a full story. Yeah, I, I have time. I'll wait, <laughs> build it out and and give it, you know, give it the kind of verisimilitude that I would need to be able to evaluate even what's being brought in as evidence. I think we we often jump too quickly to say, ah, right. OK, I see the consequences of this when someone has barely sketched the beginning of a scenario. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. And, and we get this with with atheists. Right. Well, what if there were uh, somebody who seemed to you to be working a miracle by flapping his arms and flying around the room. Tell me more. <laughs> well, I mean, he, he flapped them seven times and his name was Jim. And I wrote down on a piece of letterhead that I saw it. Tell me more. Do you have the entire national literature of a people across more than a thousand years pointing to the coming of Jim as the Messiah? Do you, you know, tell yeah. me more, show me that literature, give me the historical backdrop. Well, you can't. Mm -hmm. Right. But we think that we can play gotcha by trying to sketch something corny with a couple of strokes. And it just doesn't have anything like the layers and level of complexity and interlockedness that it would have to have to for us to begin to even talk about all right, how compelling is this evidence. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Uh, Mike Humer makes a point in a paper on Brain and Vet that as you as you fill that out more, the the probability goes down as well. Uh, that, right. that you're a brain and event, which is fascinating. Um, well, Dr. McGrew, this has been awesome, man. Thanks so much for for taking some time and helping me think through this stuff. Um, you've written so much on so many different things. Um, I'd love to have you back on to talk about some more. So maybe I can coax you into into being a guest again. Just ask, hit me up anytime. Awesome. Uh, before I let you go, is there any place you want to point the the listeners? Is is there a, you got a website or anything where they can find more of your work? Yeah, so I have uh, a curated collection of apologetics resources uh, called historicalapologetics.org. Okay. And if you go there, you'll find that there are downloads for a whole bunch of resources. Mm. So you can just go there and you can find, hey, uh, you know, I can download this old book or that old book. Everything is public domain. So everything's oh, free. Awesome. There are no... Awesome. Uh, copyright violations involved here. And we're doing it alphabetically by author's last name. And I think that we are up through uh, most of the letter F right now, but we've got wow. literally thousands of volumes wow. there. And so I love this material. I love reading the old books. And so I would very strongly encourage any of your listeners who are interested in this. Um, there are great riches out there. Yeah. And we have forgotten the names even of many of these people. And that's a shame. We shouldn't do that. Yeah. So we can recover a real treasure just by dipping back into history. And I've tried to cure it and bring together for you some of these resources. And, and I, I know I'm only up to the sixth letter of the alphabet, but <laughs> we're working on it. It takes yeah. time. And, and the person who's helping me with this is just doing it as a volunteer. Mm. So sh shout out to Sarah Enterline for this labor of love she's doing. But it's a very, very slow process. But what's there already is probably a couple hundred works, uh, some of it just exceptionally good. Yeah. So don't don't complain about the, the letter they're on until you've read all the books up until that point. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Well, thanks again, Dr. McGrew. This has uh, this is gonna have to do it for us, folks, for now. But this has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.